So a little bit about me. I'll just introduce um, who I am, what I do. So I'm Afid. I'm a 22-year-old kid from Trishur, and I hack into computers for a living. So ever since I was 13 years old, that's what I did. And I'm currently delegating that task to an AI agent. And it seems to be spookily doing better than me now. So that's what I'm doing at my startup. And my mission is to secure the software, every software that we use, like apps, any, anything, like WhatsApp, for example, Facebook, for example, anything. My startup is basically automatically scanning for security issues in these companies, and then we'll report it to them. That's what I'm doing. And we are backed by the most prestigious startup accelerator in the world, Y Combinator. And a bit of fun facts. I'm actually better known by the name Deviga. And it's a bit funny because like, I have been to like, conferences and events and people would come up to me and be like, there we go. And it's, like, <laughs> and, it's, and it's not a girl, it's a software. So I made an AI software engineer modeled after Devin by Cognition Labs in the US. So they made this thing called Devin, it was like a huge hype. It was called Devin because from the word software developer, the like developer Devin. And I was like, I thought it would be funny to make like an open source version of it. And I was like, huh, software developer, Devin. How, how about Deviga then? I was joking. But then I thought it would be funny if I actually make it and it got out of hand. So that's how that happened. And then I also hacked into companies like Google, MasterCard, Ford, et cetera, uh, by doing bug bounty programs as a kid in high school. And lastly, I really like competitions. This is what I'm like kind of known for. So I represented our country, India, at the World Skills Olympiad. So you might have heard about Olympics, right, for sports. So World Skills is the Olympics for vocational skills. So I represented India in cybersecurity there and ranked eighth worldwide after winning the gold medal in the nationals. Similarly, got bronze medal for India at the Brick Skills competition. So yeah, that's a bit about me. So you might have noticed I had an asterisk after the word security. And the reason why is because I'm not talking about cybersecurity alone. I actually want to cover about two other variants. So cybersecurity, physical security, and finally, cognitive security. Because people only talk about the cyber part of things, the digital world, what happens in software. That's the only part that's being talked about. So I would like to cover the other parts as well. Yeah. So that's the reason why there's an asterisk, because I'm going to cover the other parts of the equation as well. So I said, you know, not everyone knows what AGI stands for. So AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence. And the idea is that when machines or computers are supposed to be better at tasks than humans, that's what an AGI is, loosely. And I specifically say, you know, in the capitalism department, because when, when people say AGI, they're talking about be, like machines being better at coding, machines being better at diagnosing patients, machines being better at doing surgery, and like stuff like that, right? So, but AI is not gonna carry a baby and stuff, so like that's why I specifically mentioned that. The benchmarks are usually for the work that we do. So that's what AGI is. So let's start at where we're at, you know? We can see like what the current state of the art is. So we can really predict what the future is gonna look like. So I'm gonna cover a bit of examples of AI models that exist in this day and age uh, that kind of shows the capability that it has, yeah? And then we would cover how that would look like in the future. So, let's start with one of the most iconic stories in the world of AI. It's called AlphaGo. So AlphaGo was a model, or is a model, developed by Google DeepMind. And it is an AI model that can play the game Go, the board game Go. And this picture is of Lee Sedo, one of the strongest human Go players. And there's a documentary about this on YouTube. It's an award-winning documentary produced by DeepMind. And I recommend you watch it because Honestly, it's kind of dystopian because the AI model beat the strongest player in the world with such ease. And there's also a move called the move 37, which humans cannot explain how the AI came up with that move because humans wouldn't do that, yeah? And similarly, like Alpha Zero for chess also developed my deep mind. Does stuff like that, which humans cannot really like, comprehend how an AI model can come up with moves like this. And so that means like AI is slowly becoming better at a lot of the stuff that humans are supposed to be good at, or the humans were supposed to be good at. So I'm gonna cover a lot of the other parts AI is also good at. This is just a game, this is a board game, right? So let's see the other examples as well. So a lot of the audience here are engineering students, so I'll talk about coding. 
So Code Forces is a website for community programmers. Um, it has like hard community problems, mostly pertains to like math problems and stuff, and like algorithms and data structures. So there are like competitions that you can play to get ELO scores to really rank up in the leaderboard. So OpenAI's O3 model got a 2727 ELO score on Code Forces, which is pretty much equivalent to the 175th human, like the best competitive human programmer in the world. So it is only going to climb up, like it's never going to go down, right? And that's the case today. And this is a research paper from Google Research and Google DeepMind. And it is about doing differential diagnosis with large language models. So they did a research where they put LLMs against actual clinicians and was like, okay, who does best at diagnosing, right? And the results are actually pretty interesting. Uh, so LLMs alone uh, was better at diagnosing than clinicians assisted with the LLM. Um, and then, you know, comes below that, it's like clinicians assisted by search, like Google search, search engines, whatever. And then unassisted clients obviously came last, but it is interesting how LLMs came first, you know? And this is not the only thing. I'm only selecting like a few examples. There's a lot more, which I won't be able to cover in this talk. So I'm just gonna like setting the stage of to really convey like where we're going. So about meritocracy. So meritocracy is the concept where you need to have a lot of skills to do something, yeah? So I started coding when I was 13 years old. I was watching YouTube tutorials, reading blogs and stuff. It was actually honestly super hard. And now you have like ChatGPT and Claude and models like this, which makes it super easy to write code. But when I was a kid, I used to watch YouTube tutorials. And I was like, how do they even figure this stuff out, right? And then it took me a long time to really get that like muscle memory going on. But the rate of meritocracy or the requirement of it is coming down drastically because you don't even need to know how to code to write something. And I have an example for this, right? So let's play this video. So this is a small demo that I did uh, to really convey. This is Claude from Anthropic, and I'm asking the LLM to create a Malayalam game where words would form and letters would fall out of the cloud like raining, and you have to collect it with a paddle to form the word. It's like a Malayalam learning game. And I asked it in a single prompt, and it made it. You don't even know, you don't need to know how to code, and you got a game that's working in a single shot. And you can play it, and uh, you're asked to form the word Malayalam, then you can just catch it, yeah? So the rate or the requirement for meritocracy is pretty much going to be zero in the future. This is the current state of the art. A single prompt can make games, and you don't, you don't even need to know what a single line of code does in that. Yeah. So let's get to the segment number one, which is cybersecurity, the most obvious subject. So I would like to talk about the tale of Stutznet. So Stutznet is one of the most sophisticated malware, so like wires or cyber weapon, so to speak, that has ever existed. You know, it was made in the span of a lot of years. It is suspected to be made by the U.S. I don't know, right? It is. It has still not been con confirmed. But what we do know is that it was used to attack Iran's like centrifuge facility uh, in their like nuclear power plant and stuff. And what this malware does is actually super interesting. It was targeting the Sentinel computers and Microsoft Windows computers in the facility. And then how that was attacked was also air-gapped. So they placed random USB sticks around the facility. And like someone, an employee, plugged it in. That's all they needed. And from that point on, it started infecting into new, more and more devices. And the way of operation is actually super interesting because they did not really take it down immediately. What they did, they would basically spin or turn the centrifuges really fast, like more RPMs than it could contain, and it would just break down. And they also made it such that the status reporting is like 10 minutes behind, so they cannot diagnose what's going on. They're like, oh, this is running at this like normal speed, how is it breaking down, right? And it went on for years. They, Iran was not able to figure out, like, why, why is the centrifuge failing? But it, it was the malware that was doing it. It would spin up really fast, and it would just break down. So that was, you know, that's one of the highly sophisticated viruses. Now, what if anyone could make Sussnet, though? To make Sussnet at that day, or like at that age, you needed to be NSA, pretty much. You needed to have zero days. So zero days are when you have security issues in a software, and no one knows about it, like a secret, right? 
So if I have an exploit or like an actual hack in Gmail, and then I, I don't even talk to Google about it, and I can access any of your emails, that's a zero day. So NSA and like all these uh, three-letter organizations, so to speak, they have this stuff. But the thing is, like, as LLMs so or like AI models like this increase in capability, anyone can make a Stuxnet, yeah? So like, if someone had to be malicious in the back in the day, you needed to have skills. So if I wanted to be malicious as a kid, I needed to know how to write like an actual good exploit that spins up nuclear centrifuges fast enough. Like I don't know, how, I still don't know how to do that, right? That's super hard. But that requirement is going to go away because you don't even need to know that. All you have to do is just prompt it. And then all these AI models, they, they talk about safety all the time, but there are ways to circumvent that. You can literally ask an AI model to write a virus for you, and it would. Like in the future, it would be able to find zero days in like the Linux kernel, Windows, whatever. That's for sure. The capabilities are only going to go forward. So that's something that we should really keep in mind. So someone with a malicious intent doesn't really need to have the skills to do it. All they have to do is just prompt a model. So that's one thing that I wanted to make you aware. Now let's talk about something that people don't really talk about at all, physical security, you know, like actual physical security. So I would like to talk about one example specifically. So OSINT is open source intelligence. Uh, that's what people call it for, uh, it's pretty much professional stalking to be honest. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about finding info about people, stalking. So if you like search your name on Google and then you find someone's address, that's OSINT. If you're doing it professionally, otherwise it's called stalking. So GeoSpy is a company that has, an, that has vision models that can look at a picture of a location, yeah? So if you take a picture outside of this hall and then upload it to GeoSpy, it will literally accurately pinpoint the coordinates of the location because it has the data from like Google Street View, everything. And then it would extrapolate that into predicting the accurate location of some, like a place or like a, anything really. So if you upload like a photo to Instagram or like a story to Instagram and you're like a celebrity with a lot of followers, a stalker could potentially upload that picture to GeoSpy and be like, oh, you're in that location, yeah? So like not a lot of people think about that. Maybe even a palm tree would give away your location. There's also one uh, guy, his username is Geo Rainbolt. I recommend checking him out. Uh, he makes videos on Instagram where he plays the game GeoGuessr. It's an online game where you have to guess the location by looking at the street view. Um, so he's really good at it. Uh, and this AI model is better at it than him, of course. So I'm saying he has skills to stalk, but you don't need skills to stalk you if you have this AI model. So. That's about physical security. Now let's talk about the final segment, cognitive security. So cognitive security is pretty much about you, like your brain, like hacking you as a person. And this is going to be the most important one uh, of all. And I would like to cover a lot of other things as well, and I will get to that with a few examples in the, like, at first. So. AI models can be really good at psychological manipulation. So like gaslighting and all of that, they're good because they're trained on language and all of, like pretty much the entirety of the internet. And then they're good at it than any red flag you can find. So that's, that's how good it is. And one example is Cicero by Meta. So they made an AI model to play the game Diplomacy. It's a board game where you have to learn negotiation skills, where you have to learn how to pretty much trick people, manipulate people, do all kinds of things. And they made Cicero play against the best players in the world uh, on an online platform where the best players in diplomacy plays, and Cicero won. Uh, Cicero was able to manipulate, negotiate, and also like, handle all kinds of capture with humans, and it won. Because it is trained on, it is specialized for that, you know? As humans, we are specialized for eating food, uh, drinking water, and also gaslighting. But this is specialized in and only gaslighting. So that's better. So that's one example. And the thing is, not, it's not just words. That's the problem. So I just told you about like your LLMs, like large language models. But like AI models comes in all kinds of shapes. And it's not just words. And this is where it gets really spooky, though. This is bad. So. None of these photos are real, I swear. Like this, the, Mountie's not holding a cat. I mean, I, I made sure to generate benign pictures not to get in trouble. 
uh, do not do, I don't know whoever's watching, Mohalla, Mamuti, Nivim Poli, and this cat, benign pictures. Okay, so I don't think Mohalla has ever been to Antarctica before. Uh, that's a selfie with a polar bear. Is I prompted it to have sadhya, but AI is not good at generating sadhya. But like, yeah, it's eating food uh, at Antarctica. You cannot eat food in Antarctica anyway. So Mamuti is doing the same thing. Nevin Paul is definitely not Spider-Man in the Avengers. Uh, and this is a cat giving a TED talk. I hope that happens. So I, this is a vision board. I hope that happens in the future when cats can talk, I guess. I don't know, like a neural link implant? I don't know. Anyway, so that would be fun. So none of this is real. Now what about AI generated content though? So like, you, you know, we all scroll reels, you know that, you know, like that's what we do, doom scrolling is what it's called. Uh, so what about infinite cocomelon? The co cocomelon is good, I swear. Uh, like, you know, I, I see, I have cousins who basically just watch cocomelon. They won't eat if they don't have that. And I would like take the phone away, They're like, hey, this is, oh, and then I have to keep it. It's like, that's how addicting it is. To be honest, I get the point. It's actually kind of fun. And what if that was generated by AI models though? So like it understands what your preference is, like what the, the type of content that you like. So like you're scrolling reels and then like, ha, huh, this guy is watching this type of reels. So let me generate that on demand. That's what's gonna happen. So infinite reels, infinite TikTok, this is an info hazard. So at the moment, you have to rely on the mercy of people who create content and expect them to produce the best content that's apt for you. But what if an AI model generates them for you on demand according to what you like? And your feed is pretty much like tailored to you. That's a problem, right? We should not be AI doomers. You know, a Tata stock should end with like a really good quote, right? So uh, research on watermarking, finger pending, and identification of AI generated content is the next best problem that you should tackle. Most of you are engineering students. If you're going to academics, this is a good problem to tackle. And I believe it's possible. So I predict the solution would somehow resemble the lava lamp war by Crawlfair. You should look into that. I don't know if I have time left to talk about it. It's about generating really good cryptographic random number generator. It's really good. So, and finally, I'd like to say this. So when AI models becomes like too perfect, chasing the next big benchmark, I actually think humans would start to appreciate humanly flaws a lot more. You know, that's what I, or at least I hope you know, copium, but still, that's what I hope. So yeah, now I'm done yapping, and I can finally say this, but for real, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Thank you. <laughs>